If you had real evidence for your particular God, you'd be using that. You're telling me there is a truth of the matter to be known. You get one minute to convince me, and you're going to give me a hypothetical that you can't even prove happens as my wake-up call for how to get real. That's the best you've got in one minute. I agree with you. Because you can't point to the scriptures, they're way too convoluted. You can't point to your own anecdotal experience because that's ridiculous. You can't point to God because... He's not here. So all you can point to is some fear of dying that brings people to the brink of insanity long enough to do just that, to believe in an imaginary savior. Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Tuesday takedown, not of people, just of bad ideas, bad apologetics, and bad arguments. And it is that last one, arguments, that we're going to be looking at mainly today. We have a short with Muhammad Hijab talking about atheism. So it's not specific to Islam or Christianity or any other religion. It is just about atheists. Let's see what he says. If all the atheists were to listen to you by their own will, you have one minute. What would you say to them? I would say to the atheists, let's get real. Because the truth of the matter is this. I personally believe that there are few feminists on battlefields and fewer atheists in falling planes. If consider the following, if you were on a plane that was falling, what would you really be doing? I think there's something deep inside of you which would be calling out to the creator to help you in that situation where there's nothing else that you realize that can help you. So why do you need to be put in a situation like that for you to come to the conclusion that God is real? Why don't you know already that God is real? Why don't you live by the fact that God is real? And this is what I would say to the atheists. Let's get real. Let's really get real because I think deep down your skepticism and your philosophical positioning is just that. It's philosophical positioning which is convenient for you because you want to avoid certain truths about the world and your purpose. Ah, uh, yes. The old let's get real argument. How convincing. Because it is I, the atheist, that have clearly been living in a fairy tale for the last few years. Time for me to wake up and get real that there is an invisible being in the sky waiting to punish me to eternal torture or on his better days let me be with him forever in paradise no matter what i've done as long as i say the right few magic words let's get real now interesting enough again he is not making a claim for allah though he would be but he is talking about atheist in general and comparing this drive well when it really hits the fan you know there's something bigger out there and this is just fundamentally false i want to kind of take it statement by statement here here's the first part i want you to listen to i would say to the atheist let's get real because the truth of the matter is this i personally believe the truth of the matter is i personally believe these are two very different things. And I know that that seems like really low hanging fruit, obvious level of incorrectness, but I don't think we often see just how much that improper connection is made in all of apologetics. Muhammad has a personal belief. Fine, believe whatever you want. You cannot just in front of your personal belief put the truth of the matter is. I think that this is something that all theists forget is that we don't know. And a good theist would even say, I don't know. I can't know. It hasn't been empirically proven, but I believe, but I have faith, but I have good reason to believe even. The real truth of the matter is that nobody, not even the atheist, the skeptic, knows what happens after we die. No one knows. You can believe you know, you can think you've been shown a vision, you can feel like you have a personal word from the Lord, you can believe what other people wrote down in a book that was their best guess at the time and claim it as perfect truth, you can believe in some near-death experience that gave you insight. Those are all beliefs based off what I think is really bad evidence, typically anecdotal and highly open to interpretation, yet alone not considering any of the factors, psychologically speaking, that have contributed to it. Isn't it amazing that no one can ever just know something in a stillness? It has to be severe meditation. It has to be a near-death experience. It has to be when they were on drugs. It has to be during the worship service. Oh, you mean all the times in life where we have these extreme emotional appeals that play tricks on our brain and make us think differently, believe differently, and act differently? And that's what so much of this video is. It is not understanding the human condition and taking that as some kind of a guaranteed of the afterlife, of a higher being. So his very first statement here is just setting this whole thing up for failure. The truth of the matter is, I personally believe. What does he say next? You're in a plane right now and the plane is falling. What would you really be doing? I think there's something deep inside of you which would be calling out to the creator to help you in that situation where there's nothing else that you realize that can help you. Ultimately, what is being said here is when push comes to shove, if you really think there's no hope left, you will turn 
may be, potentially, for some people, based off their particular upbringing and culture and personal beliefs, to a higher power to try to elicit help or hope or something. Now, I will maybe piss off a lot of atheists that I can say there are probably a very good number of skeptics or atheists or people that don't claim to believe or people that are maybe spiritual but not religious or all of those other caveats that if there is imminent death, which is something the human just doesn't understand or really think about the insanity of trying to cope with that. The only thing I've ever known is about to end. Even people that are at the very end of their lives that are terminal, that know they have a long time, but there is an end coming. It takes a huge process, if ever, for them to arrive at a comfortability with that idea of death. So if you're 35, flying in the sky, you've got a family, you have goals and endeavors and people that depend on you, and in a split second, you know it's all going to be over. That is an amount of trauma and insanity that our brains are not wired to handle correctly. So again, my point was, I can see some atheists just throwing up a Hail Mary, so to speak. Sure. Does that mean there's a God? No. Does that mean we just found some deeper truth that it took us this extreme experience to get to? No. There's also a difference between throwing up a Hail Mary and some kind of last ditch effort, covering all of your bases and actually believing something. This is a distinction that funny enough, believers don't like to make until it suits them, right? They will pull on the emotional heartstrings of someone battling an addiction or someone that just had a huge loss in their life to get them to convert. Say the sinner's prayer, confess to the Lord, put your burdens on him, receive the good gift of salvation or the equivalency there in Islam since we're talking about Muhammad. And they have no problem saying you are now saved. A split second ago, this non-believer made a decision in emotional duress to some extent to claim that something is true, like this God is real and I can depend on him for my salvation. But the second that that person has any doubts or issues or they backslide or they say they're an atheist now or whatever, oh, you never really believed. You don't know what true belief is. You don't know what actually putting your faith in a higher power means. You were just doing it for some benefit. You were just doing it to feel good. Dude, you're the one who convinced me to do it during the emotional response. Why don't we have a level head? conversation. Isn't that funny that all of these huge proselytizing or evangelical services or altar calls, all of these are playing off people's emotions because it works. It gets an outcome. If you took that same person 30 minutes earlier who just gave their life to Christ and you put them in a room with four white walls and no music playing and one boring monotone person sitting in front of them that said, would you like to say the sinner's prayer? I bet you're not going to get nearly what you're going to get after an hour of preaching fire and brimstone, after an hour of playing off some guilty conscience, talking about the sin in their life and what it's doing and the consequences it's going to have for them and building this case for why they need a savior. And then you bring out the worship team and you get the experience of everybody around you crying and putting their hands up and singing and praising and worshiping and this very communal chanting, which is what this is with the right kinds of cadences and music. They only play certain kinds. They're not just playing some circus music that would take you out of the moment. They're pulling you into the moment, this emotional priming. It's done on purpose. And then the guilt trip before the altar call and they handle all the objections that are going to come up beforehand. You might not want to come up. You might be feeling like you're not supposed to. That's the devil playing on you. But do you feel a little tug? Do you feel led? Do you feel like you need to come down here right now? Show the devil he's wrong. Take a bold stance. Stand up. Make a choice for yourself. Be ready to enjoy the spirit of God. Welcome to the kingdom. Come with your family. Like it's insanity what's played and prayed upon them to get them to make this decision. But I'm on a tangent. <laughs> I have totally lost track. Let's narrow back in on what we were talking about. And what I was getting to is that these emotional responses, they simply don't mean anything. So trying to use them as a wake up call to let's get real to the non-believers to all of a sudden recognize that in a certain kind of situation, they might do something that approximates believing without really believing for some people, not all people, is a really bad argument. You know who's probably thinking differently on that plane, 
the pilot. Do you know why? Because they have something they can be doing about it. He or she might be up there still able to pull the thing out of a nosedive. And if they're already a believer, sure, they might throw up a prayer, but you know what they didn't do? They didn't take their hands off. Why? Isn't God capable of landing that plane for them? So think about this for a second. This is one of my bigger points here. If the person in the back of the plane out of control is trying to regain some control in a desperate attempt because they don't want to die, falling back on a lifetime of memories, hearing about this God that can do these great things, and there's only a great thing that can be done to get you out of this situation, it is not unreasonable that that person, despite whatever level of unbelief they previously had, might throw that up as an option because there are no other options and desperate people will try anything. If you're drowning in the ocean and there's no boats and there's no life raft and there's nothing to cling to and you know you're a hundred miles, do you just stop swimming and sink? No, you keep swimming. You keep hoping that something's going to change. You might even start swimming in a certain direction because doing something is so much better than doing nothing. So if there's nothing you can do, begging some entity that could be higher than yourself to finally show up and do a miracle for the first time is doing something. And so I wouldn't blame anyone in that situation for doing that. And many of us atheists who have never been put in that situation, yeah, we can stand here firm and be like, I wouldn't do that. It's ridiculous in the same way that I wouldn't ask Santa Claus for help. But Santa Claus hasn't been culturally ingrained into this maybe. There's a small percentage chance that there is a creator, that there is a God. If you really say you're agnostic, like you're still leaving some room there. That's the thing. If I could even admit that I would be the kind of person in that situation that might pray something. Who am I going to pray to? What God? That's a secondary issue. Sorry, I'm, I want to get back. This one feels a little more loose, but just ride the wave with me here. It's no different than your loved one is dying and you're just at your wits end and you don't know what to do. And it might be the first time in years or the first time ever that you've prayed because why would you let your ego get in the way if there's a 0.00001% chance you're trying everything. That doesn't mean there's a God. That means people get desperate. And it also means we have a cultural backdrop of religion that has infiltrated our mind and our subconscious that when our brains are going through, what are the options? What else can I do? Because we're problem solvers. We try anything, or many of us would. So what? But in the same way that the pilot keeps fighting with the plane, the doctors are still giving medicine and you still want them to. You don't believe in God enough to take your loved one home and just know that they're going to get better. You don't believe in God enough in the back of the plane to say, hey, pilot, take your hands off. Let God do this. I just prayed. We're going to be good. No one does that. So my point is we can play the hypothetical game of talking to an invisible person in this moment of severe duress all you want, but it doesn't prove God. And even if it did, which it hands down doesn't, it doesn't prove which God? It's so funny. The believer always says, it's so obvious. Look around. There's a creator, which is also ridiculous because every time they do that, they only talk about the pretty trees and the sunsets and how everything seems to work so well together. And they never talk about all the things that break down and don't work and all the harmful, horrible, horrendous things that this world entails and how unlivable it is for most of the places, most of the time without something man-made. All of these arguments are just these appeals to some kind of emotion. And it's so obvious obvious and fallible. So to sum up this point, we'll move on to the next thing he says, I wouldn't blame an atheist if they threw up a Hail Mary. It doesn't mean they've secretly always believed. Just because they turn to that as one of many options, or as the last option when there seems to be no other real options left, doesn't mean they were secretly denying Christ in their heart all this time, and now we should have a wake-up call and be living like this all the time. It just means that our brains did something extreme in an extreme situation. That's it. What if the opposite happens, Muhammad? Because I know for a fact it's not a hundred percent of people that do this. What if someone accepts their fate immediately and they sit there in a quiet calm of gratitude for the life that they've lived to no one in particular? Maybe they're just sitting there with a moment of thankfulness for their family and they smile and they're ready to go into what they believe, if they're an atheist of this particular mindset, will be non-existence. Maybe they're even happy, not suicidally so, just content with the life that they had and ready for it to be over. If someone does that, should I just say, I would tell the theist to wake up and get real? Obviously, people can be content in their end moments. And so what you say means nothing. No, you can't go off anyone's particular anecdotal experiences that are based off so many 
previous causes and their culture and what they were taught as children and what their friends and parents and family believed, etc. You just can't make decisions like this. It doesn't reveal any truth. It just tells us what certain people in certain situations some of the times will do. It means nothing. Okay, so what's the next thing he says? So why do you need to be put in a situation like that for you to come to the conclusion that God is real? So he does this little trick here. Why do you need to be put in that situation to come to the conclusion that God is real? No one came to the conclusion that God is real. Or I should say many people wouldn't. Are there some people? And here's here's the big telling part. Are there some people that think they're going to die, that bargain with God, that beg God, they don't die. And what do they do? They associate the fact that they didn't die with what they said. And now they have a belief right? We've all probably heard stories like this. So in that case, for that person, only because they lived, there was some benefit to them, they may have incorrectly concluded and now believe in God. Fine, they can do that. So maybe this is my next point. How many people have been dying, called out to God to save them, and still died? If this doesn't disprove your point, Muhammad, then you can't use it to make the positive case of your point. Because Muhammad's answer, as all good apologists answer would be, is, well, God actually did them a better favor. He's taken them to the afterlife. God doesn't owe them anything. He can take them. He's under no obligation just because they cry out. He made them. He can redeem his property. It doesn't prove that he's not real. It doesn't prove anything. Then God can't be proved real by the times that he's called out to and does deliver. You cannot have this both ways. You have to be consistent. If we're saying it's a good thing to call out to God and that he can and will show up, and those people, when he did show up and the plane did land safely, now they believe in God, then when the plane doesn't land safely, can't us on the ground say, oh, evidence against God. No, I don't think we can say that. I don't think that would be fair, but I'm also not trying to make the other point. This isn't a hard concept to understand, philosophical or theological consistency. But like most believers, Muhammad has set up a win-win for himself. Oh, you're in a terrible situation and you might cry out to God? you should then conclude God is real. Oh, you're in a terrible situation, you call out to God and you land safely, you should conclude God is real. Oh, you're in a terrible situation, you call out to God and you still die, the rest of us should be able to conclude God is still real. What? This doesn't work as proof for any of these things on any level, so you just need to drop it. If you had real evidence for your particular God, you'd be using that. If you have one minute to talk to all atheists, this is, I think, a huge point. You're telling me there is a truth of the matter to be known. You get one minute to convince me and you're going to give me a hypothetical that you can't even prove happens as my wake-up call for how to get real. That's the best you've got in one minute. I agree with you. Because you can't point to the scriptures, they're way too convoluted. Can't point to your own anecdotal experience because that's ridiculous. You can't point to God because he's not here. So all you can point to is some fear of dying that brings people to the brink of insanity long enough to do just that, to believe in an imaginary savior. The next thing he would say is, why don't you know that God is real? Why don't you live by the fact that God is real? What a stupid thing to say. He's bouncing back and forth between I believes and hypotheticallys to all of a sudden, you have concluded this. Why don't you know? And why don't you act as if you know? What? Why would I act as if I know if I don't know? Why would I claim I know if I don't? Well, he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us what our skepticism and our philosophical efforts and consistency actually mean. Let's really get real because I think deep down your skepticism and your philosophical positioning is just that. It's philosophical positioning which is convenient for you because you want to avoid certain truths about the world and your purpose. It's almost amazing how many ignorant atheist statements or bad arguments he has compiled into this one minute of him speaking. No atheist in foxholes. You just wanted to sin, which is essentially what this is saying. I don't want to deal with the consequences of this God, this creator. Now that could be its whole other video, but the quick answer is this. If I wanted to sin, I'd still be a Christian because I'd be forgiven for the sin. Christian sin and atheist sin, if we're going to use that word. So if everyone sins, which is what these holy books tell us, then if I really believed that, why would I want to be in the camp that doesn't have a get out of jail free card? I don't don't know any Christian that doesn't sin anymore. The only difference is a profession of saying, I shouldn't be sinning this much, but they still do whatever they want. Christians divorce at the same rate. They commit crimes typically at a higher rate, at least from incarceration records, but there may be some correlation and causality facts there that need to be addressed as well. It's been found they have abortions at the same rate. They abuse children at the same rate. Like, come on, you would have maybe a leg to stand on if there was any evidence that the Christian sins less or lives a better life. And you have none of that. And in many cases, depending on country and culture and some other factors, you have the opposite of that. I wonder if the believer and the apologist has ever really considered that it just makes truly 
no sense to say that there is this denial by atheists. Am I just some masochist who loves to penalize myself? Did I just willfully sign up to make my life harder? Or did I really start to lose good reasons to believe in the concept that there is a good creator who wants a personal relationship, who made me personally, knows me, loves me, and who gave us a holy book that we can believe in that is valid and true? It's the latter. I lost a belief because the evidence was so horrendous. And no amount of personal experience, because it's so flawed, was going to convince me, lead me to the conclusion that this God in the sky exists, which even if he did, we still have to make a whole nother case for why it's Allah or why it's Yahweh, why it's Jesus, etc. This whole video just fails. It's a failure to recognize reality. It's a failure to recognize psychology. It's a failure to recognize neurochemistry. It's a failure to recognize the individuality of people, the uniqueness of people, the way that all people cannot be categorized, that there would be believers that in that very situation would actually lose their faith. Just like there might be unbelievers that gain a faith. There might be people playing Pascal's wager on that plane. There might be people trying to fix things. There might be people just praying because it's the only thing they know how to do. It might be people praying to different gods on that plane. Let's get this plane from a major international airport and see how many different gods get prayed to. That doesn't help me conclude that there is a god. That helps me conclude that people from religious backgrounds who believe in deities that are higher and more powerful than them will oftentimes, even if they're not sure, turn towards those potential deities for potential help when all else is going to fail. That means nothing, literally nothing. So please, believers, apologists, take this out of your arsenal. This argument that you just want to sin argument, that you were never really a Christian argument, all of it, so ridiculous, so fallible, so debunkable. But I digress. That's it. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Let me know what you think about this topic in the comments below. We are going to be back on track this Thursday with Secular Bible Study, so look forward to Jeremiah on Thursday. Here's all my previous videos from last week. So if you haven't checked any of these out, feel free to go give them a click. And until next time, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my Iconoclist, GVI, Jacob, Jason, Joe, Oliver, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared, Carolina, and Christy, my atheist advocates, Anne, Elijah, Rocket, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel, or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine patrons. Thanks, and have a great day.